everybody, it's Dr. Lori. This is Ask Dr. Lori Live. This is where you ask the questions, I give the answers, all different topics, other information with you too. So first of all, we're going to look at some photos. How about this? <sighs> I'm going to te te teach you why this is rare, right? So in upcoming videos and videos that are on the channel, I'm going to teach you why is this rare. And I'm also going to talk about at the end of this video, I'm going to show you basically what's special about this. Why do I have this reaction also? And hey, look at what I found in a thrift store. I found this when I was thrift shopping as well. And at the end of the video, I'm going to talk about them and specific tips and also their value. So if you don't want to listen to answering questions, you want to just speed ahead if you're watching the replay um, to the end, you can do that too. But let me tell you, my content is evergreen. No other channel is like this channel. I'm going to teach you what to look for, what it's really worth, and how to cash in. So nice to be with all of you. Thanks for joining me. Before I reveal all of that, I'm taking your questions. So um, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, I suggest you subscribe. Why? You get alerts of when the channel's on, when a new video drops, what other things that we're doing here. So I think you should subscribe. That's first. And second, when you're on the channel, use the search feature. It's like any other search engine. It's the search feature for this YouTube channel. So you can find when I'm talking about, you know, custom jewelry or glass or paintings or, or designer bags or whatever it might be. So hi to all of you. I want to know where are you watching from? Where are you joining us from? We have a fantastic community, wonderful, fun folks. And of course, we come together here. My lives is also on, on my classes. So you can sign up for those at drlaurieV.com if you like. So bought a printer's proof lithograph. Okay, so for those of you who don't know what a printer's proof is, that's the proof that the printer does to proof the piece, not the artist, but the printer to basically say, okay, we're doing our job right. The printing process is coming along very well. I didn't see the second half of that because I was thinking about printer's proofs. Signed on the plate, it's called signed in the plate, but okay, as well as the print. So what that means is it was signed actually during the printing process by the artist and then signed on the actual piece of paper outside of the margin of the actual um, plate mark. Uh, only three of 10, wonder how much I should ask. Okay, well, here's why I can't answer that question without seeing it. And why? Because first of all, I don't know who the printer is. I don't know who the artist is. I don't know what the subject matter is. You have to tell me this information by showing it to me. And I need to see a visual. How do you show me a visual? It's very simple. And I will review them through my website, drlaurieV.com. It's right there on the homepage. You see that little, that little icon? It says send photos. It looks like a camera. Click on it. Fill out the form. Attach the photo. And I'm going to get back to you. I'm going to tell you, do this, do that. It's worth this. It's not worth it at all. Whatever I tell you, follow the directions and you're going to be able to get your appraised value. Uh, and the appraised value will help you understand how much you should ask. Would a printer's um, proof be worth more than an artist's proof? Not typically, but the fact that you have number three of 10, that's a low print number. That means I'm not a lot of them are out there that have been printed. 10 of them have been printed only and you have it an, one that's early in the print run, number one, number two, number three. So that's great. Uh, so that will help you a little bit, but I suggest what's it gonna hurt? All you have to do is fill out that form, click on that, that icon on my website, fill out that form, go from there. It's right there on the homepage. Um, it's easy to do, people do it, millions of people do it all the time. Uh, Jackie, I want to know, I sold my Fibril glass for a little more than you identified and appraised. Thank you for your help. Oh, I'm happy for you, great. Um, I'm not surprised at that. We have lots of success stories. And in fact, if you have a success story where I helped you, whether it was an appraisal or information or teaching you how to research, whatever it, whatever it might be, you of course, you of course could send me your, your actual success story. I want to hear about it with a photo of the object if you have it, because we're putting together um, some more uh, information about those success stories. It's great to know how great you guys are all doing. I want you to succeed. That's why I work so hard to be able to teach you all of this information so you can use it to your benefit. So get in touch.
Oh, thank you, Lisa. I think the video calls are great. I have fun talking to all of you on the video calls. And of course, it's easy for you to book right on my website. Costume jewelry is on a downtrend. I don't know where you've been, Anna. I have no idea. I have not seen that. I've seen a lot of competition and I've seen the prices go up. Um, I've heard all these people saying, oh, no, you can't get that for it. You can't get this for it. But the people who are having success stories who are following me, they're getting those numbers. They're getting big numbers for costume jewelry. Um, actually, I had a, store, a, a client recently who had someone offer them a lot of money for a piece. And, they, and the person who was offering them that money was going on a hunch. They're not even sure that it is what they think it might be. They're just saying, yeah, I'll take a risk. And it's still well into the thousands. So I'm telling you, there's a whole lot of, of, of interest and a whole lot of, um, of value in those costume jewelry pieces. How are you going to know? You want to know about costume jewelry from me? Search the videos right here on this channel. Just put costume jewelry into the search right here on Dr. Lori's YouTube channel, and you're going to find all those videos. Not on a downturn, not by a long shot. Um, Yes, you're very welcome. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. So Mary's talking about the Black Friday deals, uh, offered some great discounts. And there are more great discounts actually on my specials and shop page, if you want to look at it. Um, great discounts on lots of different things, but you're welcome for that. I'm glad that you're going to get a um, Christmas present or gift certificates for yourself or for your loved ones. You know, appraisals are the kinds of things for people who have everything, right? There's a gift for people who have everything, right? Thank you very much for the super chats and super stickers. As I said, that's what helps me to continue to keep doing all of this for you. Um, there's lots of folks out there who are like, oh, you know what, I'm trying to do what I can. We do our part, of course, with our Black Friday deals, but thank you for mentioning that, Mary. I'm glad you took advantage of it. I know a lot of you have, and I hope a lot more of you will uh, check out the website and the specials page because the specials page is where we put all the specials. <laughs> That's where it is. Hence the page. So there you go. I'm so glad to hear that. Uh, terrific to hear how well you're all doing. And of course, that you're benefiting from the channel and that you're learning from the channel. Like I said, you know, it's not like all these other channels who are not teaching you what to look for. They're going, oh, it's this. And oh, I sold it for that. But I'm not really sure how much it is. And I thrifted here and I thrifted there. That's all well and good and great. But they can't identify how do you find it? What do you look for? What kind of materials? What's right about it? What's wrong about it? I'm happy to share my expertise and my experience and my education. I want you to be able to do this. And I have the proof that's in the pudding because all of you are saying, hey, Dr. Lori, you told me, you appraised it. I learned from you. I sold it. I've got top dollar. That's how it is. Purchase from Goodwill a set of copper looking silverware set. Copper looking. Okay. Um, estimated 101 pieces in a box with a drawer underneath. So I'm, a, I'm envisioning one of those wooden boxes, the drawer underneath pulls out, you can put all of the silverware in there. Okay. What marked on the wooden box, James Quality Jeweler, $49.99, do appraisal or not worth it? So you want to know, is the appraisal going to be worth it? Okay. I have to see the object. It's the same thing I would say before. I have to see the object, you know? Is the box worth $49.99? $49 you're saying a 10-minute call with me for $49.99 for three objects for me to do a verbal appraisal? Um, I'll tell you, it's going to be worth it. I'll tell you why I think it's worth it. Sure, you're going to get the appraisal for those three objects, but you know what else you're going to get? You're going to get me sitting in front of you to answer whatever question you come up with in that, those 10 minutes. Do you know how vital and important that could be for you? You know, people say, I didn't even think that she's actually guiding me in that time that she's actually answering my questions and helping me understand these concepts. You know, there aren't other people at this level who are really doing that, especially not for that. So you decide it's up to you. But I would say that for, you know, that particular piece, send a photo in, let me take a look at it. If it's not worth the cost, I'm going to tell you that it's not worth the cost of the appraisal because I don't, I wouldn't want to spend money on something that's not worth it. But to be able to talk to me and to get me one-on-one, -on -one, even this, even this, to be able to do this and be able to have these questions answered one-on-one -on -one and any follow-ups, I say I'm going to answer any question, which I am. So basically, I think that's pretty great. I really do. Not because it's me. I don't have that much of an ego. People go, oh, she has such a big ego. It's not really about that. It's about the opportunity. Take the opportunity because the opportunity may not always be here. So take the opportunity. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry to the producers. I missed that one. Is Alexis Lahelek costume jewelry collectible? I'd like to see it because 
I don't know if that's correctly spelled, but I'd like to see it. I'm not saying that that's your fault, but it may not be that. I kind of have a headache, so I want to make sure that I'm seeing that correctly. Um, I don't know. Let me take a look at the actual piece. Had an interesting thing that a lot of people uh, didn't realize. I was talking with a client and she was trying to identify a particular piece. And I said, one of the things that a lot of people don't think about when they're identifying, eh, let's just use costume jewelry as an example, but about any object in art, antiques, or collectibles is focus on the details. Because a lot of times the details are going to be something that is characteristic of a maker, a designer, a manufacturer, than the overall piece. Is December a good time to sell framed art? What's the best time? You know, Linda, this is very interesting. Um, many of the large auction houses historically, going back 100 years, have had an early December auction. And early December auctions are usually filled with art. And the reasoning for that is that art, of course, is always a very interesting and popular. It's kind of like um, a, lot of, a lot of young women get engaged and a lot of young men get engaged um, at this time of year. Art is one of those big ticket luxury items like jewelry. And a lot of times, uh, December is a very good time to actually resell fine art. So um, the auction houses have been doing it for a long, long time. And of course, it is a good time to do that. Anytime holidays, holiday times, and anytime where there, people are thinking about shopping and shopping a lot for something special, art usually comes into play. Thank you very much for that super chat and super sticker. I appreciate all of them. And again, the super chats and super stickers, any amount helps. It helps a lot. It helps to keep the lights on in the studio. It helps for travel to different, of course, locations when we do the thrift store shopping videos, when you thrift with Dr. Lori. You know, we're going all over doing those. We're traveling, um, you know, far away from my Bucks County offices to do those particular videos because I want to show you the whole country, not just the same five goodwills that other people do. So I want you to be aware of that too. So thank you very much for helping to support us and for showing your support in any way you can. It's helpful and thank you. I got tea bowls with writing, not carved, but raised, okay? So it's not incised or carved on this ceramic tea bowl. It's actually raised, okay? I've looked everywhere for years, but I can't identify them at all. Well, let me ask you, is there a good source to identify writing? Okay, so I'm assuming that what you have is calligraphic, basically character uh, or Asian writing, Asian language writing, correct? So that's why you're having problems with this particular piece. I would like you to show it to me so I can probably help you identify it. When you say, I can't identify it at all, you know, no one knows what it is, the big mystery, you know, um, you know, I might disappoint you and actually be able to identify it. A lot of people like to keep looking. Oh, I want to keep searching and asking and such. Maybe that's not your role here, but I want you to be able to show it to me and I can probably help you. Um, the other thing about identification with respect to that, very, very difficult to do, but I've seen a lot of pieces I probably can help. Are hair receivers valuable? Why did they want to save their hair? Interesting. I did a video on these. And uh, if you search the channel, you'll be able to find it. And hair receivers um, are something that was very, very commonplace on a vanity in the early 1900s, on the vanity, right on the um, dresser or bureau you would actually see, again, a hair receiver, which is a little bowl with a hole in the center, and people would put their hair in it. Putting their hair in it would actually allow them to save their hair after they brushed it. So you brush it with a brush, like, I have so much hair. I have hair everywhere. I mean, I, it's like I have a dog in my home, <laughs> and which I don't, because my hair is so thick and it's everywhere. Well, what they would do with hair receivers is they would brush, 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 then they'd clean out the brush, they'd put it into that hair receiver, and they'd wait until they accumulated enough hair to make a craft out of the hair. And the craft would actually be where they would braid or otherwise do sort of like macrame, using the hair as threads or as strands. And then they would make bracelets and they would make other things with them. And it was a very popular craft from about the time of the middle 19th century, like pre-Civil War, all the way until like the 1920s, 30s. Um, so yeah, that's why hair receivers are still popular. They usually are part of a set, a vanity set, a tray, a little trinket box, uh, a hair receiver, maybe a powder jar where you put the face powder on. I hope that answers your question. I've been buying and selling antiques for 40 years and learn, oh, then that's very nice. And learn more by watching you than in all that time. Well, Sherry, that's very nice. 
Um, I'm so happy that I'm able to share my expertise and to help. I'm sure that you are a wealth of knowledge as well. But again, be able to provide this kind of information is not common. So I'm glad it's helping you. It really warms my heart to hear someone who's so honest who's able to say, hey, you know, I've done this a long time and I've been successful at this for 40 years, but I still have more to learn. I think that's a great way to look at it. Thank you very much. That's a nice sentiment. Um, have you heard of Clay Pottery by Bruce Robinson? I have. Hi, Rosie. Um, it's funny, you're Rosie Peach. Well, maybe that's not your real name, <laughs> but it's funny. It's cute. Um, have you heard of Clay Pottery by Bruce, Ro Bruce Robinson? Yes. A lot of these studio art potters will have what are called ciphers or symbols for their name. Sometimes they'll sign their name very clearly. Sometimes they won't. I always say artists who want to be famous realize they've got to sign their name clearly. <laughs> I've said that for decades. And it's true because a lot of times these artists will not sign their names very clearly and it's very hard to identify. I taught you on one of the videos though how to do it. If you're having trouble and you're struggling to figure out what the artist's signature is, then in fact, um, struggling like that, you can search the channel and learn how to actually I'll give you tips on how to actually figure it out. Thank you very much for that super chat and super sticker. As I said, it does help us. It helps us tremendously to continue to do what we're doing. Are double signed lithographs usually generally worth more? Yes. Yes. If it's signed in the plate or in the stone, because the lithograph is actually done on a stone, and then it's pencil signed in the margin, that means that that artist not only signed it during the time when he was, the process when he was making the actual print, but also went back and touched that piece of paper after it was printed and signed his name again. So that's very important. People don't always understand why they do that, but that basically means, look, I looked at this as the artist. I looked at this piece and realized that that, that print looks good to me. Pardon me, that kind of thing. So that is generally the truth. Thank you very much, Lori. Many of our longstanding followers, you know, decades, people have been watching me, you know, and following me for a long, long time. Thank you, Mary. Um, of course, are always supporting us and we appreciate that too. Um, I've been doing this since 1998. I've been a professional appraiser since that time. And Dr. Lori's Antique Appraisal Comedy Tour continues to travel the nation uh, where, of course, I do the live events. You can look at our schedule at my website. Um, yeah, you're very welcome. I'm happy to answer your questions, any of your questions, right? You know, am I cooking for, for the holidays? Well, hopefully not too much. <laughs> you know, have I been swimming in the morning? Yes, I have. You know, what else is happening? I don't know. My hair's full of chlorine. <laughs> I'm, I'm breaking some of the ornaments in front of me. I don't know. What other, what other uh, things can I tell you? Does a painting that has an art gallery printed on the back mean it may be worth something? Like an art gallery label, like, oh, it was at Joe Schmo's gallery. It could mean that it's worth something. It could mean that it has uh, an exhibition record, right? It could also mean that it was on display in that particular gallery. It could just mean that that work of art was brought to that gallery and it was framed there, but never on display there. Uh, gallery labels are not a bad thing. They usually can help you identify provenance from the French word to prove it or the history, lineage, or background of a work of art, but it could just mean that they were they brought it to that gallery to have framing services done, but it could also mean that it was in an exhibition there and that could impact its value. Yes, it's possible. So thank you very much for your super chat and super stickers. Um, I do appreciate it. And I know that, you know, times are tough and you support the folks who, you, uh, who are helping you. So we're trying to help you. But thank you for those. Keep the questions coming. Let me know where you're actually watching from, too. I always love to know where you're watching from. Some of my favorite places around the world, right? Um, love the Macy's artwork on your table. Yeah, this piece of Macy's artwork actually is an original drawing. And it was submitted to be a publicate for a publication for a magazine ad um, in the 1960s. Really, really cute. Um, I don't have any artist information to share with you, but it's quite cute and uh, it was appropriate for the holidays, but I'm sorry, I might've missed your question. Um, you're going to uh, see, you're going to New York with your daughters. A lot of people go into the city, into New York. I grew up in Connecticut, so we always called it the city. Um, a lot of people go into the city, into New York, of course, at the holidays to shop and such. Um, should I try the Chelsea Flea Market? 
Um, if you've been for costume jewelry or any advice for thrifts, I've got a lot of advice for thrifts in New York. Um, the village is my first advice, right? Get to Greenwich Village. The other thing I would say, uh, Chelsea Flea Market, sure, always good. Um, the outskirts as well are quite good. And I give a lot of these tips of where I've been uh, thrift store shopping, of course, on my Thrift With Me videos. So check those out when you search the YouTube channel. So that'll be helpful, I think. Uh, have a good time with your daughters and, you know, spend some cash, right? <laughs> Thank you very much, Jackie. We appreciate your support. Um, and I know a lot of people go, oh, she doesn't have to thank everybody. I had a mother who is up in heaven going, you have to thank everybody. So I try to do my best about thanking all of you when you do a, a nice turn to all of us. But for the holiday season, we really appreciate that. Um, we really appreciate all of that. Oh, Malta. Wow. Yes, that's nice. That's nice. Thank you very much for being with me. Um, it's great to see all of you guys from all over the world. I love to hear that. Thank you very much, Colleen. Thank you for your support. We appreciate it. And again, we appreciate all the super chats and super stickers. We appreciate when you, well, I appreciate when you share the videos. I appreciate when you watch the videos. I'm just like, you know, watch the videos. It's going to help you. Best way to identify an oleograph. I have a video on that. You can search the channel for oleograph right there at the top. You see the search, Dr. Lori V. It's this channel, oleograph. And the way to identify it, easy to do, not hard to do at all. There, of course, is um, the website with our specials and shop page, which is popular as well. But for the most part, you know, and when you're looking at oleographs, remember that you're looking at a fake painting. So don't expect to see the same things in a real painting as you will in an oleograph. There's a reason why they're different. But search the channel and I explain it. Yeah, great. Um, oleographs are pieces that some people really like because they like to see those pieces that are reproductions. I, of course, as a purist, want you to get an original. I want you to get an original. It's worth more. Found a painting by Charles Watcher. Is the artist well known? The artist is known and he is listed. What does that mean? He's listed. Well, listed artists are basically those artists that have had an exhibition record or are listed in some of the fine art reference guides that most of you don't haven't even heard of because this is really something that a lot of the folks who are so-called experts now don't really talk about. And why is that? Because they're searching in a different way. They're just searching based on their name and not basically understanding what the background is. The reference guides actually will help you to identify where did this artist train? Where was he most, he or she most active? That means, you know, was he a Californian and he painted mainly in San Francisco? Or was he from Canada and he ma painted mainly in Ontario or whatever it might be? So that's, that's important. Also, if his works are in particular museums, particular important private collections. Um, that usually is identified also in a, an, an art reference guide. But people are surprised that they don't know about this. And I'm saying they don't know about this because they're just willy-nilly searching around the internet, hoping someone with or without information or with or without a background or expertise will tell them something. And then they believe that to be true. You got to know your source. A lot of this information is not true. I've been correcting so many of these of this information that comes out of all of these different so-called experts, even in these places where they're saying, oh, they're getting experts. You know, I get calls from many people who are seemingly experts saying, you know what, I don't think I did this right. Can you fix it? So, you know, get the right information from the right source. And we make it easy to do. We make it easy to do. I think it's very easy to do it through our website as well as right here. So thank you for that question. That was great. Lots of questions. What should I look for when going through my grandmother's vintage cookbook collection? Oh, condition. Look for um, well-known, well-known publishers and well-known chefs, right? I want you also to look for historical um, pieces. And if you want to know all there is to know about cookbooks, I've got a video on that. You could search the channel. Um, I'm going to remind you to subscribe, which is, of course, hitting the bell, subscribe to the channel so you get those alerts when we do a new video. Um, one of the biggest cookbook collections is at the University of Michigan's Clements Library on South University in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So if you're near there, you might want to uh, visit one of the biggest collections. I always say, you know, you're going to learn the most about a category of art, antiques, and collectibles in places where you're not tempted to buy, like museums. Um, you can learn in thrift stores, and you can learn, of course, in other places 
but you're going to learn a lot if you start to understand what to look for. Cookbooks, great collectible. Everybody wants them. People collect them. And you can really find them for a song if you thrift with me. Um, I have a cut and style Barbie. Oh, right. From, uh, okay, Pennsylvania with a receipt. The only two words I can read is Barbie on the back and I read Malaysia. She's still in the box. Okay. I'd have to see it uh, to be able to give you an, an, an idea of value. But I've appraised a lot of Barbies. Oh my goodness. I did. I must have done, I must have done close to a hundred videos, interviews with all different folks about collectible Barbies and what you look for uh, during, of course, this whole craze with the bar ahead of that bar, the Barbie movie. I think they might re-release the Barbie movie too. They're going to do something cool with respect to Barbie after this summer's, of course, uh, Barbie craze. <laughs> so much fun. Barbies can be valuable. Many of your old dolls can be valuable too. What is it called when a section of a print is reprinted? Can they be valuable? When you have a restrike, or a reprint or a reproduction, it depends on what who the original artist is. So if you have um, a print and it's been reprinted in a different state by a particularly famous artist, I don't know, Chagall or Picasso or Rembrandt or whomever, um, they can have value. They don't usually have value have as much value as the original printed image. So um, I'd have to see it, but I could certainly help. Good question. Prints are difficult. I talk a lot about prints here on the channel to teach you what's what. So, found a peg calendar probably from Alaska. It's so unusual, I don't know what to do with it. Well, what do you want to do with it? Do you want to learn more about it? Then send me a picture. You want to just go, I don't know what to do with it? Well, then say, I don't know what to do with it. I don't think they're very unusual. Um, I've seen a lot, but then, you know, I've seen a lot. So, I think it's not unusual, but, you know. I would say, and because I've seen so many objects, I tend to go, oh yeah, I'm familiar with that. But I will say how you acquired it is probably very cool. So we'd like to, I'd like to know how you acquired it. That would be fun to know, but I can certainly help you uh, with it. And if you're thinking, I don't know what to do with it. And maybe that means I don't know where to sell it or how to sell it. My selling class, which is so popular, and I am running them again, of course, the, the four part selling class. Um, you know, it's easy. You just tune in on Zoom and I do the selling class and folks love it. And it's a great community of people who are, some are seasoned resellers. And I, I have some people who are taking my selling class who've been selling for 25 years, but they know they can still learn more from being part of that community. Um, that you can also sign up for and register for on our website. But um, if that's what you're trying to ask me, like, I don't know what to do with it. I don't know how to sell it if I wanted to sell it or I don't know whether I should keep it, or I don't know how to preserve it. All of those are great questions that I can answer for you. Send me a picture. Let me take a look. Um, this, of course, is Ask Dr. Lori Live, and I'm taking your questions from all over the world. I bought a buffet for $75, okay? And then I found a Tiffany & Company small Tearbrock bracelet stuck in the back of the drawer that wouldn't close. Oh, so you're trying to jam the drawer, but the bracelet's in there. Oh, good. I would hate that. I'd be so nervous. <laughs> be like, oh no, did I wreck it? Did I wreck it? What was the end of that question? I'm sorry, I didn't see it. Seventy-five dollars. So you got the buffet, the you know, the big piece of furniture. The bracelet value is now eight hundred. Okay, I'd like to see the eight hundred dollars small teardrop bracelet that was stuck in the back of the drawer. Uh, what kind of condition is it in? What type of marking? Um, does it say Tiffany and company? Did I appraise it at 800 or are you just thinking it might be worth that much? So congratulations, by the way, there's a lot of things that could be found. It'll teach you a couple of things when you're buying. First of all, look in all of the drawers, right? Second of all, you know, I'm glad you only paid $75 because a drawer that doesn't close, you should question, right? The drawer should close and open easily in a piece like that. Um, and then the other thing you want to think about is you want to think about, well, where was this piece? What was the background of that piece? So, but that's great. Congratulations. That's terrific. There's lots of things that you can find, of course, when you are shopping on the thrift, as they say, when you're shopping on the thrift. So, cool. I found a collection of handwritten recipes in an old metal recipe box. Well, I'll tell you, it probably was my mother's old metal recipe box because my two sisters were cleaning out my mother's kitchen. I was not there. 
my mother was in a, a, a facility at that point and they were cleaning out and they threw away her recipes. I could still like wring their necks. I don't know what they were thinking. I'm sure they were just so busy, overwhelmed, so much stuff, uh, but they threw away the recipe. So maybe it's not hers, but maybe it is. How would I put them up for sale? They are all written in script and nicely organized. Well, it's not difficult to sell them if you wanted to sell them. Um, the idea would be you could group them, desserts, entrees, something. You could sell them all in the in the box itself. And there are lots of different places to sell them. One of the things I talk about in my selling class is where do you sell certain ob where do you sell certain types of objects? The rare and unusual, the common stuff. Where do you actually sell these things? And I go through platform by platform, what's great about it, what's not, what works, what doesn't. Recipes that are personal, excuse me. Recipes that are personal recipes like that, that are just all handwritten, um, are actually some of the things that people do look for. Uh, there are lots of people who collect recipes, so many of them. You know, what's also interesting about this is um, cursive writing. Cursive writing is not something that was taught in the schools throughout much of the 90s and early 2000s. So, you know, a lot of people don't even know how to write in cursive. Uh, so sometimes that idea is very popular with people too. So uh, found some chocolate. <laughs> Susan's like, hey, I found pocket change. I thought that was good. <laughs> well, it is good, Susan. It is good. We're happy for you too. So that's terrific. That's terrific. But yeah, it's funny because sometimes that's what happens when you find, you know, you buy an old dresser or you buy um, something with pockets. Uh, I remember one of my clients who bought a pair of pants um, at a uh, thrift store, at a, a Goodwill style thrift store. And she paid $5 for the pants. They were nice wool pants. She, were ha she was happy they fit. She put the hands, her hands in the pockets and she came out with a pair of diamond earrings. So you never know what's going to be in there. What does dépousé on French jewelry mean? A couple of different things. You will see the word dépousé or D-E-P-O-S-E -E, on pottery, on jewelry, on many items, which indicates, of course, the manufacturer. And not that the manufacturer is called dépousé, but that it was actually manufactured. So that's a good question, too. That word comes up often, and it comes up indicating that it was made. You'll also see other forms, um, other types of marks, like... Um, uh, poorly man, which basically means by my hand or it was handmade. Uh, you might see the Italian equivalent too for, for handmade, but, uh, you'll see that a lot on mainly on better, better quality French ceramics. And of course, jewelry. Hi, Michelle. We're trying to determine the value best way to sell a Molthorpe movable chair school desk by the Langs Low Fowler company. Okay. Well, I can certainly help you with that. I need to see a picture of it front, back, and a close-up photo of any marking or label. So uh, not difficult to sell furniture. However, you don't want to ship it. So I have tips on what you do if you have a big item, big physically, you know, big in substance, that you actually want to sell, how you can get top dollar for it. So yeah, just submit the photo right to the homepage at drlaurieV.com. Click on that camera icon, fill it in, and uh, I will reply. So it's right there. There it is. Says, Send photos, get a report. Easy to do. Don't forget, of course, about our unlimited appraisals. Um, the priority Ask Dr. Lori service. If you have storage lockers full of stuff or you have households full of stuff, or if you're downsizing, a lot of you are like, I forgot about downsizing. Right. I need an appraiser. Hey, you need an appraiser if you're getting a divorce or if you're having some other kind of life change too. I can help. What type of glass should a reseller be on the look for? What's making a comeback? American Brilliant Cut Crystal uh, is making a big comeback, and you will also see it reach its pinnacle, the 100th year revival in 2025 and 2026. So that's what you should be looking for, and you should be looking for quality, quality. So quality in glass comes in many forms. The big names, right? The names like Blanco, the names like Murano, the names like Fostoria and others. And I talk about them too. What should you look for, right? All of these videos, whether I'm in a thrift store or whether I'm here in the studio or whether I'm at one of my events are videos that are going to tell you what to buy, what it's really worth, how to identify it so you can resell it for top dollar, how to identify it so you can collect it and 
keep it so it will increase in value until the time when you don't want to have that collection anymore. All these videos have that evergreen important information. It might look a little bit different, but they the information information you can use. You know, I I was on I've been on television for 25 years. Let me tell you something. One of the things that I learned very early on was let's give the people news they could use. So I'm going to give you the information you want, the information you could use, not just walking you around. Um, the bracelet is an Elsa Peretti. Excellent. Elsa Peretti bracelet made for Tiffany. That's going to be a winner. And of course, probably worth today a little bit more than that $800. So be careful who your source is. I'd like to see it before I confirm or deny that $800 value that you just uh, that you just stated. So send in a picture. Let's take a look. Uh, great, great pieces. Nice questions. Terrific things. And remember, at the beginning, I told you that I was going to help you to learn a little bit more about some objects in some of these other videos. So, for example, you know, the I'm going to give you some values for those pieces that we talked about at the beginning. So the, the videos that have, of course, these nice pieces that I showed you in the video where these particular pieces are featured, um, these three pieces are basically, I show you how to tell what type of glass they are without using a black light. So if you say, oh, I left my black light at home, I forgot, then I'm going to tell you that. And the value of those three as a set, $100 for those three. So those are quite nice in a video that you can search for that's right here on the YouTube channel. And also this, this particular glass, why do I look like that? Why was I so excited to see this particular piece? Because it was a rare form for this particular style of blown glass. The price, well, they wanted $24.50. What's it worth? 75 bucks. So that was an opportunity where you could have made three times what the actual asking price was. So you can find this stuff if you watch my Thrift With Me videos, which you can search for right here on the channel. And then, of course, one of my favorites, I love those designer handbags. And this, of course, is I'm showing you how to authenticate this particular designer handbag. This actually is a duffel bag, a major one, too and others, I'm gonna show you how to identify those designer handbags when that you can find when thrift store shopping. That one was worth $3,500. That's right, it was a real bargain, that's for sure. But that's a beauty. I'm gonna show you how do you identify it? How do you know if you're looking at a fake or not? What are the characteristics so you can find it? Other people aren't doing this for you. I want you to succeed. I wanna thank all of you. For your super chats and your super stickers, thank you for being with me here tonight on Ask Dr. Lori Live. Take good care. See you next time.